Let's shift a little bit now and, and talk about uh, treatment and, and to start with kind of initiating treatment. And Dan, maybe you could just give us like a broad overview, maybe even a little bit of history of, of, of uh, HIV treatment and kind of where we are and, and, and what's happened in the last few years to Sure. Well, you know, we're now in the th uh, uh, getting into the fourth decade of antiretroviral therapy, right? We first started giving zidelvudine or AZT monotherapy in 1987, and uh, for a couple of years we had only one drug to give, and and we did a lot of sequential monotherapy, and then we started with two drug combination therapy, really from about the mid 90s, uh, when the uh, non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, or NNRTIs as we call them, and the protease inhibitors, or the PIs as we often call them. Uh, came around, we, we hit on triple therapy, which was really the, the magic bullet, because right. that, that that gave enough drug to get uh, complete viral suppression, so there was no opportunity for mutations to emerge that weren't already present, and that seemed to be able to keep viral suppression uh, uh, constant and, and prevent any uh, disease progression. Um, but the regimens have just gotten better and better in terms of their safety, their tolerability, and their convenience, so that we now have numerous single-tablet regimens that are uh, three different uh, antiretroviral agents in a single tablet that can be taken once daily, uh, and they're all highly effective. They're all extremely well tolerated, although each one has its own uh, potential uh, uh, toxicities and side effects. They're fortunately relatively infrequent and, and generally mild, uh, so that uh, anybody who starts on treatment today, especially if they start at an early stage of disease, can expect to live an essentially normal lifespan. Yeah, talk, talk about that. I mean, it's so dramatic, Eric, this, like, talking about people um, living a normal lifespan. Uh, and when you, when you first meet them and you talk about starting them on therapy, I mean. It's amazing, because uh, some of us on the panel have been around for a long time. <laughs> <We're>, <laughs> we remember when you know, we met people with newly diagnosed with HIV, we didn't have a lot of good things to say to them as far as their long-term prognosis. And now, that's all I talk about when I meet somebody who's newly diagnosed, is how well they're going to do. And to tell everyone they know that they choose to share this information with that they're gonna do fine because there's still this perception out there that it's gonna be hard to treat, maybe there won't even be access to treatment, It's going to, the treatments are gonna to have toxicity and that they're gonna die from AIDS. And that's anything but the case for the people who are able to engage, right? Uh, yeah. You know, the, the cascade, we all knew it in clinical practice, but it looked at it in a sort of an objective way, what proportion of people who are infected, who know their status, are actually engaged in care. Those of us who work in the clinic, we spend a lot of time on the people engaged in care and we know how great they're gonna do, but then there's this whole other group. So my focus is always to tell them, as long as we can get you engaged, and that usually means overcoming some of the real challenges, things like poverty and stigma and substance abuse, alcoholism, and psychiatric disease, and focus their attention away from HIV and AIDS and dying on dealing with these problems that are important to deal with, whether you have HIV or not. Eric, so, so just go ahead and walk us through when you say the cascade. Maybe people that are listening don't quite know what that means. Sure, so we think about it as the, the cascade or the continuum of care where they look at the proportion of people in the United States, although you can look at this in any area outside of the U.S. or anyway, sure. within subpopulations within the U.S., and you probably have to, because every group is a little different. But the, the data suggests in the U.S. there's about 1.2 million people who are infected. Uh, we know that about 85% of them now, which is a, probably an improvement mm -hmm. because of more Certainly. routine testing, uh, know they're infected. And that's all great. Uh, then you look at the proportion of people that know they're infected that have ever encountered an HIV provider, and you get this huge drop-off of like 50%. And then of that subset that actually are retained in care, which they usually define pretty loosely as two visits or more, right. uh, and the drops-offs more, and then you finally end up with how many are on therapy and how many are suppressed. And you know the numbers are improving, but you know you start talking about numbers of like 40% in the US that are known to be infected that are actually virologically suppressed. And if you look at some of the higher risk groups that we've talked about, it's probably even lower than that. 